Hello everyone, and welcome to this video on drugs for hematopoietic disorders. And I'm excited to share this information with you today. We'll be covering a range of medications used to treat conditions affecting blood cell production. Let's dive in. Let's start with the basics. Hematopoiesis is the process of blood cell formation, a vital function that begins with stem cells in the bone marrow. This process is carefully regulated by hormones like erythropoietin and thrombopoietin, as well as growth factors known as colony stimulating factors. These factors stimulate the production of erythrocytes, platelets, and leukocytes, ensuring the body's demands are met. Without this process, we wouldn't have enough red blood cells to carry oxygen, white cells to fight infection, or platelets to stop bleeding. These regulatory proteins are now manufactured as drugs, giving us the power to boost blood cell production when the body falls behind, especially in patients who are immunocompromised or have bone marrow suppression. This diagram illustrates the complex process of hematopoiesis. You can see how pluripotent stem cells in the red bone marrow differentiate into various cell lines, ultimately leading to the formation of platelets, leukocytes, and erythrocytes. Notice the key factors like thrombopoietin, interleukin-2, colony-stimulating factors, and erythropoietin that drive this differentiation. It's like a family tree of blood cells, all branching out from a common ancestor. These visuals help you link drug classes with their effects. EPO stimulates the RBC line, while GCSF targets the neutrophil line. As nurses, knowing which line a drug influences helps us predict lab changes and patient symptoms. Now, let's talk about how we can use this knowledge therapeutically. Hematopoietic growth factors can be created using recombinant DNA technology and used pharmacologically to stimulate the production of erythrocytes, leukocytes, or platelets. Common indications include renal failure, anemia, and bone marrow suppression caused by medications like chemotherapy or diseases like HIV. This slide illustrates the erythropoietin mechanism. When blood oxygen levels are low, the body releases erythropoietin, which stimulates the red bone marrow to produce more red blood cells. This increases the oxygen-carrying capacity of the blood, restoring homeostasis. Think of erythropoietin as your body's natural oxygen sensor. When kidneys detect low oxygen, they send a signal to make more RBCs. But in kidney failure, this feedback loop is broken, so patients get synthetic erythropoietin to do the job instead. Here, we delve into pharmacotherapy with erythropoiesis stimulating factors. These are indicated for conditions like CKD and anemia due to chemotherapy or zidovudine treatment for HIV. Be aware of the black box warning regarding cardiovascular and thromboembolic events. Also, note that hypertension can occur in a significant percentage of patients. The table provides details on darbepoetin alpha, aranesp, and ipoetin alpha, epogen, procrete, including dosage and adverse effects. As nurses, we play a crucial role in managing patients on erythropoiesis stimulating factors. This slide highlights key nursing considerations, including assessing blood pressure and cardiovascular status, evaluating for desired and adverse effects, and teaching proper injection technique. You'll assess for signs of improved oxygenation, like increased energy, but also monitor for headaches, chest pain, or swelling, which may suggest complications. Educate patients about self-injection if going home on therapy, and remind them this is not an iron replacement. It only works if iron stores are adequate. Let's move on to colony stimulating factors. Our prototype drug here is filgrastim, Granix, Nupogen, a human granulocyte, CSF. The goal is to rapidly increase neutrophil counts in immunosuppressed patients, reducing their susceptibility to life-threatening infections. Indications include chemotherapy, bone marrow stem cell transplants, and certain malignancies. 
Continuing with filgrastim, remember that it can be administered IV or subcutaneously. It's crucial to avoid administering it within 24 hours before or after chemotherapy. Be aware of potential side effects like fatigue, rash, fever, and bone pain. Closely monitor WBCs due to the risk of serious adverse effects if they exceed 100,000 mmHg. This slide focuses on the nursing process for colony stimulating factors. Encourage rest and fluids. Evaluate for therapeutic and side effects. Teach infection control measures and sub-Q injection technique and report any concerning symptoms like palpitations, dizziness, or allergic reactions. Patients may be overwhelmed if they are already immunocompromised, so stress the importance of hand washing, mask use, and avoiding crowds. Teaching self-injection can empower them, especially if they need repeated cycles after chemotherapy. Slide 11. Colony Stimulating Factors. This table provides a comparison of different colony stimulating factors, including filgrastim, pegfilgrastim, and sargramostim. It lists the root and adult dose for each drug, as well as their adverse effects. Remember that italics indicate common adverse effects, and underlining indicates serious adverse effects. Each agent has a different half-life and dosing schedule. Pegfilgrastim, for instance, is long-acting and only needs one dose per chemo cycle. Understanding this table helps you anticipate lab results, prepare patient education, and explain what symptoms to watch for. Now let's discuss platelet enhancers. Oprelvecin Numega is the only drug in its class and is prescribed for patients with thrombocytopenia. It stimulates megakaryocytes and thrombopoietin, increasing platelet production. The slide details the subcutaneous dosage and potential side effects, including edema, fever, and dyspnea. Thrombocytopenia puts patients at high risk for bleeding. Oprelvikin can help rebuild platelets after chemo, but it's not without drawbacks. Watch for signs of fluid retention like shortness of breath or swollen ankles. This drug isn't used long-term. It's meant for specific low platelet scenarios. Let's shift gears and talk about anemia. Anemia is a condition where red blood cells have a reduced capacity to deliver oxygen to tissues. This can be caused by loss of RBCs, excessive erythrocyte destruction, or insufficient erythrocyte synthesis due to deficiencies in erythropoietin B12 folic acid, or iron. Anemia isn't just about low hemoglobin. It's about how the body's oxygen delivery system fails. Each cause of anemia points to a different treatment plan. So identifying the underlying issue is step one. You'll encounter this often in surgical patients, pregnant women, and those with chronic disease. This slide illustrates the morphologic categories of anemia based on red blood cell appearance. We have microcytic, hypochromic, macrocytic, normochromic, and normocytic, normochromic anemias. The table provides examples of each type, such as iron deficiency anemia for microcytic, hypochromic, and pernicious anemia for macrocytic, normochromic. This classification helps narrow down the cause. Microcytic usually means iron deficiency. Macrocytic points to B12 or folate deficiency. Normocytic is often related to blood loss or chronic disease. You'll match this info with labs like MCV and MCHC to guide interventions. Anemia can manifest in a variety of symptoms. This slide highlights common symptoms like pallor, fatigue, shortness of breath, and dizziness. Note that symptoms in red indicate severe anemia. The body compensates for reduced oxygen by increasing heart rate and breathing rate. That's why patients may feel like they're running a marathon just by walking across the room. Always assess for activity intolerance and monitor oxygen saturation in symptomatic patients. Vitamin B12 deficiency is often caused by a lack of intrinsic factor, which can result from inflammatory diseases or surgical removal of the stomach or small intestines. Pernicious anemia a specific type of B12 deficiency 
can affect both the hematologic and nervous systems. Treatment involves cyanocobalamin, administered parenterally or as a nasal spray. Intrinsic factor is produced in the stomach and is essential for B12 absorption in the small intestine. Without it, even if your diet has enough B12, your body can't absorb it. That's why many patients with gastric bypass or chronic gastritis need B12 injections for life. Watch for neurologic symptoms like numbness, tingling, or difficulty walking. These may not reverse if left untreated. Folic acid deficiency can result from insufficient dietary intake, alcoholism, or malabsorption disorders. Folate deficiency during pregnancy is linked to neural tube defects. Treatment involves increasing dietary intake and folic acid supplements. This slide also shows foods high in folate. Folate is especially important for pregnant women to prevent birth defects like spina bifida. Alcohol interferes with folate absorption, which is why alcoholics are often folate deficient. Teach patients to increase foods like leafy greens, citrus fruits, and fortified grains, and emphasize the importance of prenatal vitamins for women of childbearing age. Iron deficiency is the most common cause of anemia. Causes include GI bleeding, blood loss during menses, pregnancy, and surgery. Treatment involves increasing dietary intake of iron-rich foods and iron supplements like ferrosulfate, fiosol. Iron is essential for hemoglobin production. Without it, red blood cells become small and pale, and the body can't carry enough oxygen. Common food sources include red meat, spinach, beans, and fortified cereals. But remember, iron supplements are more effective than diet alone in correcting anemia quickly. When administering ferrosulfate, monitor hemoglobin and hematocrit frequently. Use the Z-Track method for IM injections. Liquid preparations should be sipped through a straw. Absorption is best without food, but GI upset is common. Be aware of the black box warning regarding overdose in children. Iron can cause constipation, dark stools, and stomach pain. Teach patients to take it with food if needed but ideally not with calcium-rich foods or antacids, which reduce absorption. Using a straw with liquid forms prevents staining the teeth. The black box warning is serious. Even a small amount of iron can be fatal to children, so store it safely. Let's test your knowledge with a practice question. Which of the following patients is at the highest risk of having pernicious anemia? Take a moment to consider the options. Think about which patient is most likely lacking intrinsic factor. It might be someone with a history of gastric surgery, chronic GI inflammation, or older age. These clinical vignettes test your ability to connect pathophysiology to patient risk. Here's another practice question, this time focusing on nursing interventions. Which of the following interventions should be included when teaching a parent how to administer oral iron supplements to a two-year-old child. Look for answers that emphasize safety, correct administration, and side effect management. In pediatric care, giving the correct dose and avoiding iron toxicity is critical. Encourage use of droppers or syringes for dosing and watch for signs of GI distress. Thank you for your time and attention. I hope this presentation has been informative and helpful. Keep on subscribing, liking, and sharing.